Hi everybody. Welcome to episode 70 of Maine Politics. My Masonic history lesson. And a playthrough, a full playthrough of Super Castlevania 4, which is my favorite game of all time. I'm going to say it here. I'm going to tell you guys here right now, Super Castlevania 4, I have decided, is probably the best video game ever made. And I also think Masonic history is one of the coolest topics ever. One of my favorite topics. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of actually me playing my favorite game, discussing one of my favorite topics for three days in a row. So get ready for a full playthrough of Castlevania 4, Super Castlevania 4, with three full days of Masonic history. Um, and I think some of you already in the chat are, you know, kind of familiar with Freemasons already. Maybe. But, uh, you know, I, I hope I can tell you some things that you haven't heard before. Because, um, you know, as you know, I don't subscribe to a lot of other people's sort of conspiracy theories about the Freemasons or other things in general. So, um, I have a lot of stuff to talk about. And be patient. Uh, I know I said that I'm, I know originally I said that this was going to be about the Masonic history of the United States. But I have actually decided this, I have decided to um, go into some early Masonic history to try to figure out where the Masons actually came from, compare their own history, their own self-stated history, which is clearly false. The Masons actually believe um, they are descended from, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. I don't want to start getting into it now. But basically, there are two narratives. There, the one, well, actually, there's three narratives. So the, there's the historical narrative about the Freemasons that you can uh, find in history books. There's, the, there's their own mythology about themselves, which is false and sort of self-invented. And then there's my own theory <laughs> about how... Uh, the Freemasons came to be, and actually what their main influence was. And this is something that kind of shocked me, because after all the research and all the knowledge that I thought I already had about Masons and their influence in the United States, um, this, what I'm going to tell you today, kind of blew my mind, because I was completely, completely ignorant on this. And to me, it kind of, it's a slam dunk case that the Masons were heavily influenced by a particular movement and a particular individual who you may not automatically think of as their main influence. I mean, maybe some of you have, or maybe you've read about this before, but I hope um, I'm going to tell you some new stuff today. So I'm excited to do that. Um, and I never wear hats, so I know this hat looks like way too small, too. I don't know what kind of Mason... Um, Masons have small heads, maybe. I don't know. Small skulls. Let's get, into some, let's get into some phrenology about Freemasons. Let's measure some Masonic skulls. Um, yeah, please don't soundbite that and upload that. Just that section. That, that would get me canceled instantly. Um, but, hey, so I'm just going to say hi to everybody. Persona. Glad you're excited about this topic. Obviously, so am I. Very excited. You know what? I'm going to take this fucking hat off, though. Is that okay? If I don't keep the gag up for the whole um, stream? Is that okay with you guys? Okay. Thanks. I just... It's like bothering me. I don't wear hats. I don't, I don't wear anything but regular clothes. I don't even wear, like, jewelry or anything. I, it's always bugged me can't get into it even wearing a wedding ring um it, it just like it like physically uh bugs me <laughs> so i can't wear one um david well in part two of this three-part masonic history lesson i am actually going to spend a great deal talking about someone who was allegedly assassinated for revealing Masonic secrets. Uh, that is actually where it'll get um, 
the second episode will focus on the American history of Freemasonry because if you want to make the argument of where Freemasonry had the biggest influence in the world, it was uh, the United States by far, by far. Hey, Arnaldo. Hey, JC. Hey, Modus. Good to see you. I think you'd be particularly entertained by this subject, so I'm glad you're here. Hey, bird worldist. Thanks for calling me a king. Hey, south of the border smoker. Hey, Oz Whistles. Oh, you said your dad was a Mason. Wow. Um, speaking of Grand Pooba, is Grand Pooba, that's not a Masonic term, is it? Because Grand Pooh Bear is actually one of the most expert Mario Kaizo players online. So if you haven't watched any of Grand Pooh Bear stuff, that guy plays Mario Brothers. I mean, I've seen like speed runs of Mario Brothers and stuff where people are like, oh yeah, dude, like I beat the game. You know, speed runs are impressive to me, but this guy doesn't just do speed runs. He does like virtually impossible Mario runs. It's pretty awesome. William Morgan, David. William Morgan. Um, so South of the Border Smoker, um, that's a perfect question, actually, to intro this episode. Because before I, you know, go off on Freemasons, I look like I'm slouching here. I'm, hold on, I'm going to kind of fix this a little bit. Can I even move this? I can't make this chair any higher than it is, so um, I know it looks like I'm slouching on the camera, so I don't I don't want to look like I'm slouching too much. Um, Oz whistles, yeah. Working class Freemasons became a thing later on. Um, originally, it was it was definitely not a working class thing. Although they'll claim that that's where their history originates from, that they were working class stonemasons, um, you know, going back to biblical times. But South of the Border Smoker asked, at what age did you start getting into the Masons? Well, um, probably when I was like 16 or 17 years old. I mean... There was a Masonic Lodge in the town that I grew up in. And I remember as a kid thinking it was probably no different. Or just, I remember like I would ask my parents or at, I, I don't remember what adults I would ask. But, you know, I was a curious kid like a lot of kids are. I saw the symbol, you know, on the town sign. Um, I saw the symbol like on the side of the building. And I remember asking like my parents what it was. And I think my grandpa told me it was like the Rotary Club or something. My grandpa was part of the Rotary Club. I don't actually really know what the those clubs really are or how they're significant, but like the Elks Lodge, the Lions Club, um, the Rotary Club, those kinds of things like were just gentlemen's clubs, I think, that were sort of emulating the Freemasonic gentleman club aspect. Um, even the Flintstones had a, uh, uh, like they, they did like a parody of those kinds of gentlemen clubs. I forgot what, what they called it in the cartoon, but they wore like a Viking helmet kind of thing. And I don't know if you remember that. The fucking Flintstones. Um, but I got interested in it through via a friend of mine, um, very close friend of mine growing up. He's actually the same guy that's in the beheading video. I'm not going to say his name. I've already explained why uh, he doesn't want me to bring up his name. But you can find out if you want. You can look it up. Um, this guy uh, was raised very Catholic. And his grandparents, um, basically his own parents allowed his grandparents to raise him in a very hardcore Catholic church. Uh, I, I believe it's actually a similar Catholic church to the one that Mel Gibson's father uh, is part of. Um, which is a very traditional pre-Vatican II Catholic church where you actually um, will go into the church and a lot of the masses are still in Latin. Uh, the women still wear head coverings. It's the easiest way to understand this sect of Catholicism is that it's pre-Vatican II. Uh, Vatican II was sort of a, um, 
almost like kind of a liberal update to the Catholic Church that most Catholic churches, including the Pope and all the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the, the hierarchy of Catholicism now subscribes to. But this pre-Vatican II church, I remember when my friend and I would hang out, one of the interesting um, things that he would bring up to me was sort of a conspiracy theory that was very popular in this church. And um, the conspiracy theory was essentially that the Freemasons weren't necessarily satanic, but they were behind the secularization and the destruction of Christianity worldwide, specifically by infiltrating the church from the inside and then taking it down from the inside and creating Vatican II, essentially. Um, Dre G, you know, I actually don't know. Can you break apart that acronym? If you broke apart SSPX, uh, I might be able to tell you. That doesn't sound familiar to me, though. But it's probably similar to what you're thinking. I mean, look up the church that Mel Gibson's father was part of. It's similar. So I remember one day um, he, and and I don't know how much of a believer he was at, still at this point. I think he was just doing it to keep a good relationship with his very hardcore Catholic grandparents. Um, but I remember he thought I would be entertained by this particular like sermon by his, the priest at the church that he went to. And, you know, I was like already like a angry atheist kid. I probably actually would have been one of those idiots into Sam Harris if I was in high school, being completely honest, like aggressive atheist, like fuck religion, like Bill Maher when he dunks on religion that like really made me excited and shit like that. I mean, just, you know, babyish kind of stuff. I was never raised religious. I think the only reason I had that kind of reaction to it is because I dated a really Catholic girl in middle school while I was starting to get really hormonal. And maybe that was my mini version of my me being an incel um, when I was in seventh grade. But basically, I rebelled against religion, you know, in sort of a generic way. Um, she was a perfectly nice girl. She was just very, very Catholic. Um, she wouldn't even kiss me. Nothing like that. So I think I probably just, I got like a chip on my shoulder about dating a really Catholic girl in seventh grade. And I just remember like hating on religion after that. And um, I, so I, I mean, even by the time he played me this tape, I was like, I was still sort of in that phase. Like when I was like 16, 17, I remember thinking like, I'm just going to make fun of this stupid tape. You know, why, why would you play this for me of your priest? You know, I think all this shit's stupid. I mean, I, I, I make fun of the Catholic church all the time. I obviously think it's lame. Um, but when he played it for me, it was basically, think of like a, a smart, articulate, like conspiracy YouTube person breaking down the history of Freemasonry in like a super eloquent way. And uh, I was just like, wow, this is, I was like, this is your priest? Like this guy? This guy sounds like a, he's kind of like a conspiracy theory guy. Because at the time, I, I wasn't super familiar with conspiracy theories. I didn't even hear of Alex Jones yet. Um, but I remember being like really intrigued by it because I, you know, I was already like grew up on the X-Files. Um, I was already interested in like the topic of conspiracy theories or like cryptozoology, uh, esoteric things like the occult, almost just like as a hobby, I would research it and sort of be fascinated by it. But beyond that, um, I remember thinking, wow, this is a really interesting rant that this guy is going and like, what the hell is Freemasonry? And, um, you know, my friend would start explaining things to me. And most of the explanations revolved around how the Masons were evil and, like, basically made the world secular and, like, destroyed religion. Now, even like, <coughs> Reformed, like Vatican II Catholics, will actually still echo the idea that Freemasons are dangerous and that um, it's not really compatible with Catholicism. What's interesting, though, is that most forms of evangelical Christianity today, even ones that like believe that people are demons and stuff, some of those Christians are Masons. Um, there's a lot of crossover with like evangelical Unitarian church, um, Freemasons and military people. There's a lot of crossover there today. And what's interesting, though, is Freemasonry, one of the 
prerequisites for joining the, the lodge or the or fr- Freemasonry in general, any lodge, is that you have to believe in God. Now, that could be any religion, um, except maybe some forms of Buddhism, which I guess don't believe in God. Um, which I think even some, well, no, I don't know if that's true. But that's one of the prerequisites of becoming a Freemason. And it's not really compatible with people who are hardcore Catholics or Christian. Because if you are a, a fundamentalist in the religion that you believe in, typically you will think that there is only one true God and that these other religions' interpretation of God is false or is wrong. What's different about masonry is it is designed to accept, it's designed to become this like secular thing where you can believe in any God. As long as you believe in God, you are, you can become part of our club. So you have to believe in the existence of God. Arnaldo De Leon says, hey, Robbie, do you think religions like Christianity and Islam are reactionary because they oppose social progress and embrace right-wing politics? I mean, that's a whole can of worms. That, that would require like a whole other podcast to go into the political implications of when Christianity and when Islam came around. Um, but I will say from a tradition point of view, to me it's interesting that Christians hate Muslim, like most like secular or just even regular evangelicals in this country hate, you know, Muslims and Islam. And I don't think most of them understand that Islam is actually based off of the Bible. I mean, a lot of things in Islam got folded into um, Islam that come from the Old and New Testament, both. They don't have the same point of view about who Jesus is, but they believe he's like a prophet. So they worship like the Virgin Mary um, you know, it's so it's interesting how I think most people are very, very ignorant on how connected the two religions actually are. Yeah, David, I mean, the third book, I mean, if that's the argument. If you want to look at it chronologically, that is kind of what it was. Yeah, Voltavin. I mean, that's probably the case. I mean, that is a, definitely a commentary specifically on the ignorance of America. I mean, Americans have been, are, are dumb, just dumbed down. Catholicism is not compatible with secrecy. Yeah, I mean, actually, I will talk about some of that later because the Knights Templars played a role in this as well, that they sort of got excommunicated by the Catholic Church for doing things that were too secretive and also they believed were occultish, and there was a split. But the Knights Templar were originally Catholics involved in the Crusades. Um... Dre G. Yeah. Yep. Volta Vin, I'd like to hear more about that. Um, so let's get into. So, first of all, let me just ask you guys how many people here know what King Solomon's temple is? Like, if you're if you've read any of the Bible or you were raised Christian or Jewish, chances are you've already heard of King Solomon's temple. But <clears throat> what do you guys know about it from, from what you've heard? Like what, what can you tell me about King Solomon's temple? I'm just curious uh, what the chat knows about it. Um, I wasn't raised religious, but I already understood the significance of King Solomon's temple because um, the Freemasons' own history, own self-stated history, 
This is universal. I don't think there's any main, like prominent Masons or even lodges that disagree with this, their own internal history, which is that stoneworking, stone masonry, was traditionally throughout the centuries sort of a secret art. Um, it was something that most people did not understand how to do. It required an understanding of mathematics and geometry. And in biblical times, B.C., um, it was still considered like a very secretive uh, like trade where there were things called stoneworkers guilds where they would have these secret societies where they would hide and share aspects of their trade. Um, I was just talking to Lori, my wife, about this. And she says that, um, I, I forgot what book it was that she read, but she read a book that had a really long section on glass, the art of glass making, glass blowing throughout history. And there was a long period of history where glass blowing and making glass was almost considered like magic. People died uh, trying to find secrets about how to make glass. It was like a very, very secretive trade um, that people held these secrets very close to the chest and they would pass down their, um, you know, their glass making uh, trade secrets to other people, like before they would die and stuff. So people took like shit like this really seriously. I mean, back before the internet, back before everything was just like a, um, you know, there's a tutorial on how to do everything in book form. I mean, think before even publishing. It's like if you, if you had, if you were like one of the, you know, if you learn this stuff, why would you share it with other people? You'd just be allowing competitors to like steal your trade. Interesting, Volta Ben. Um, and so I don't think, um, who's, who's actually saying anything about King Solomon? The temple gate in Jerusalem. Um, David, um, that is what some biblical scholars believe, but the temple itself's location is up for dispute. No one knows exactly where it is, apparently. Um, and it's partly because it's either made up from the Bible or, uh, the areas in which, um, archaeologists and like historians would need to dig and explore are in very politically contentious areas. So like you'd have to dig up and excavate very politically sensitive areas of Israel. Um, this has kind of been the issue for a long time for any biblical scholar, any historian that's ever tried to like, you know, really prove that some of these iconic locations in the Bible existed and things like that. You know, a lot of the cities in the Bible obviously did, but like temples, um, the areas where these different people lived, a lot of people have, uh, you know, run into this issue where not just the Israeli government, but like all these different, you know, even like Palestinian uh, authorities, a lot of different political groups will essentially make it impossible to, to do any of this sort of excavation work. Um, so what I'm saying is we don't, there, historians e are either believe that it's, it wasn't real that it was just talked about in the Bible, or that it's it does exist somewhere, but it's been destroyed, that probably the story in the Bible of it being destroyed is true, and that maybe there's some remnants of it somewhere in the in the world. Likely, a lot of archaeologists have said if it does exist, it exists in Jordan, in this one specific area. But it's been already built over by mosques and churches. So to actually excavate it would be really sensitive. You'd need to like basically destroy a mosque. Um, and I don't know if that's the case now, but that was, that was tr the case for a while. There's a lot of these areas where you'd need to verify that this place actually existed or discover more artifacts. You, you just can't. I mean, the political situation right now is impossible to do. Um, you know, they still do excavation around areas of Israel, like in the mountains and stuff, that's where they found those uh, infamous Dead Sea Scrolls, I believe. So there's still a lot of like archaeology, archaeological digging happening in Israel and places like that in Jordan. But it's not, it's, if, if archaeologists had their pick of like the top five places to dig and to find, they don't, they can't. It's like the top five locations they'd want to excavate 
are just unavailable. They would not be able to get permission from the government. Interesting. So yeah, if you're seeing the chat right now, you'll you'll see that the the it's up for dispute where the temple was. Um, and from what I'm about to tell you now, I think it's you know it's also up for dispute that the temple actually ever existed, because the temple has a special place in biblical history. And also in sort of esoteric, occultist, and Masonic history as being the key to unlock the universe. Not even just the key to unlock God, because Freemasons, you know, they believe in sort of a secularized version of God. Freemasons actually believe that King Solomon's temple holds the key to unlocking the secrets of the entire universe. And I didn't fully understand this, actually, until maybe like a month ago when I was researching um, the origins of Freemasonry. So as I was saying, the history of Freemasonry by their own, their own tellings, their own history is that they specifically, it's not that Freemasonry is an evolution of the stoneworkers guilds in general, which were real things that existed all throughout time. It's that Freemasons were a specific offshoot of a specific guild of mace stonemasons who built King Solomon's temple and not just built it like, like low level workers, you know, like low slave labor wage workers, but were integral in the design and received instructions potentially even directly from God. That somehow King Solomon, even though he was the one in charge of building this temple and according to the Bible and Hebrews and people who study Kabbalah, King Solomon was actually given a special magical tool from God that some people and some Jewish scholars, some people who study Kabbalah, actually believe it is a living creature that Solomon used to cut stone, like a laser. Other people, other biblical scholars have described it as almost like it's a laser, like a magic laser that can just cut straight through stone or any object. And so there's a lot of different history with different you know, interpretations of the building of King Solomon's temple. But the Masonic history is that they were directly there, working directly like with King Solomon, receiving the decoded messages from God on how to build this. And But they didn't design it. See, because here's the crux of all this. The reason why King Solomon's temple is considered the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe is not because... It's supposed to hold the Ark of the Covenant, which is historically, even in the Bible, it says that it does, that it holds Mo Moses' stone tablets and the Ark of the Covenant. It's not just that it's because uh, a lot of Catholics and religious scholars believe that it also holds the Holy Grail. So ba basically you have both Indiana Jones movies in one. So Indiana Jones, um, Steven Spielberg, you know, could have just writ wrote one Indiana Jones movie where Indiana Jones goes to King Solomon's temple. Um, but that's not the reason you would think that those are two big reasons why that everybody would be like, okay, this is the, these are the key, you know, this is the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Alexander the Great, um, I'm trying to think of all these, not Alexander the Great, but there's been other people throughout time, even during the Crusades that believed if you had access to these biblical artifacts, they were almost like weapons that would make you win wars. They even talk about it in the Bible that the Ark of the Covenant in different people's possession was a powerful sort of talisman sort of weapon that would give you automatic power over your enemies. You had the power of God on your side. Um, and just so you understand, I'm not Christian at all. I don't believe in the Bible. Um, I think it's totally allegorical at best. Uh, but this history really fascinates me because I believe King Solomon's temple uh, from my point of view, is sort of an underrepresented, magical, and important physical object in the Bible. If we're talking about physical objects, um, uh, you know, the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the uh, the crucifix in which Jesus was crucified on. Um, you don't usually hear about King Solomon's temple in and of itself being a extremely important artifact 
so important actually that the Masons sort of revolve their entire belief system around it. Uh, this may not be something that you've heard before, and it's not even something Masons will actually admit to. They won't say that our belief system revolves around this sort of magical, mythological quality that King Solomon's temple is supposed to have. But I strongly believe that that's where the Masons actually got almost all of their occultish beliefs from and all of their inspirations from. The reason why Masons, and not just Masons, but other religious scholars in the 1700s and the 1600s believed that uh, King Solomon's temple could unlock the keys to the secrets of the universe is because apparently the architecture itself of King Solomon's temple wasn't just like God was suggesting to King Solomon, okay, build this here, do this here, this looks neat, let's do this. Is that God was literally, this is how the story goes, literally encoding the secrets of time and space and the nature of the universe mathematically in the actual architecture of King Solomon's temple. So, in case you didn't catch that, the crux of a lot of the magic behind King Solomon's temple is not because of who King Solomon was, not because he was the king of King or the son of King David, not even because of the artifacts that it held there. The reason why the temple itself is so important is that apparently God himself encoded the secrets of the universe, time and space into the actual architecture of the temple. And that Many people believe throughout time, if you were actually able to figure out how the temple was built, what it looked like, how it was designed, that would automatically help you be able to decode almost every prophecy in the Bible. That, that there was, that the language used in Revelations and all the prophecies in the Bible was actually coded, and that it could be decoded by understanding the encoding uh, that God was supposedly putting into King Solomon's temple, hiding all the secrets of the universe, including time and space. Now, if you haven't heard this before, um, I recommend looking it up. Uh, I am I, I'm particularly fascinated by Old Testament things that seem very magical, and, and they kind of creep me out. I'm not saying I believe in any of them, but I find this particularly fascinating. Um, and just to give you an example of how like disconnected, you know, this era of um, Christianity was, you know, because this is, keep in mind, this is Old Testament. In the Bible, <laughs> in the Bible, King Solomon, this man who was receiving instructions by God, who was chosen by God to encode the secrets of the universe in this temple, had 300 wives and 700 concubines. <laughs> and that's actually in the Bible. That's not even like historians have figured that out. Like the Bible like openly talks about it. They only name one of his wives in the Bible. And they talk about it almost like as a marriage of convenience or something like that. But he had literally a thousand women. Uh, if the Bible is to belie be believed... King Solomon was tearing it up. Um, so not only did God encode the secrets of the universe for him in the temple that this dude got to live into, he had a thousand different women. Um, it's a pretty interesting thing. So, And, you know, oddly, I am already getting Q vibes. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because I just did a QAnon podcast, but... There's definitely some interesting things that remind me of Q from this, from Freemasonry, from numerology, and, um, and, and more about, uh, I haven't told you the whole story yet, but there's just a lot of things in this that remind me of Freemasonry, or, or remind me of the, the, how the QAnon followers see things. You know, they believe they're all numerologists and, and understand all this stuff. Wow, I've already been talking for 41 minutes. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, people. I feel like I've been ranting. Um, so 
So what am I missing here? Oh yeah, I know. I know where I'm. I know where I'm missing. What I'm missing here. So, there's one of the most famous names actually you'll hear in Freemasonry. Is a very biblical sounding name. I was actually confused. Uh, stupidly. And Masons are actually very good at this because they have a very rich history and very rich lore to themselves. So one of the most famous names in Freemasonry is this guy named Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name. He's also known as the Widow's Son in Freemasonry. Um, if you've ever heard me make jokes about Masonry on here or on Twitter, is there no hope for the Widow's Son is what is widely considered a Masonic distress uh, signal. Um, that if you say that out loud in public and you're actually in distress, like something ha bad is happening to you, it's supposed to be a signal to other Freemasons to come help you. Um, and this is all documented. I'm not making any of this up. But there's another one that's called the Masonic distress signal. So other than saying, is there no hope for the widow's son, you can also do a physical gesture where you're supposed to stand upright, completely straight up, and then hold your arms like almost like in a square pattern above you, like almost like hands up, don't shoot, but in a very square rectangular design. Um, those are those are two documented uh, Masonic distress calls. Now, Hiram Abiff. And this, I'm reading this from Wikipedia, so I'm going to like be paraphrasing Wikipedia. I know it's, it's lazy, it's shitty to do that, but I mean, the, the Wikipedia article has a pretty good summation of who he was. It says that Hiram Abiff is the central character of an allegory presented to all candidates during the third degree of Freemasonry. So if you know anything already about Masonry, the third degree of Freemasonry is considered like when you become almost like a real Mason. Up until that point, it's almost just kind of like you're a mason in training. It doesn't really mean much. The ritual at the third degree is actually like very, very intense. Um, I'm a sensitive person in general. Like you guys, if you ever listened to me uh, on with Thaddeus Russell, like I completely was unable to um, do a, uh, what, what did he try to do? Like a role playing exercise where he pretended to be Robert Kagan. And he was really good at like, acting like he was like an evil neocon all of a sudden and he just drops this on me on the podcast and i'm like like actually i'm like on it i mean i didn't tell him this but like i was kind of like intimidated by it i didn't know how to react to it i felt like i would have done a better job arguing with robert kagan because i actually hate kagan so much like i would have used my like rage you know to help me um so i know if i did one of these rituals like i'd honestly be like scared as shit it's a scary thing you're basically blindfolded and you're made to recite all this this language and these like sort of poems and and things while you're basically being told that you are going to be murdered on the spot unless you reveal all the masonic secrets and they put you through several trials of this just in the third degree ritual you can actually find a great video online that was done in like the 1980s some public access TV show did like inside Freemasonry and they show the entire Hiram Abiff third degree uh, Masonic ritual initiation ritual being done. It's absolutely fascinating. I, I recommend you actually watch it. It's not it's not sensationalist. It doesn't it's not even really edited. It's like pretty much just here's the ritual. Here's exactly what they say. Um, here, here's what they're supposed to recite. And let me explain to you what the ritual actually is, uh, how, what like how they enact it. So Hiram Abiff is presented in Masonic lore as being the chief architect of King Solomon's temple. Even though what I've already told you is bit in the Bible, King Solomon was getting instructions directly from God and passing them on to architects. So Hiram Abiff was in this lucky position, according to Freemasons, of being directly in between, you know, the person who is channeling God and the actual builders who are supposed to follow these instructions. So Hiram Abiff was like one step away from God's instructions. 
Now, the actual, um, the actual Bible, there are characters in the Bible who had things to do with King Solomon's temple, and the name Hiram actually comes up twice in the Bible having to do with King Solomon's temple. The, the, word, the name Hiram Abiff never does. Um, that seems to be a complete invention of Freemasonry, that, um, that that actually was never from the Bible. Hiram Abiff. Just like how the name Tubal Cain, so there's another uh, Masonic code word, Tubal Cain, uh, spelled T U B E L C A I N. Tubal Cain is actually in the name of a character in a Bible, but he's just like a side character that has no story, and he happens to be some kind of builder. So Masons really look for, or they think that they're finding, you know. Like, they basically invented a, a character out of whole cloth named Hiram Abiff from the Bible to insert themselves into the King Solomon story. I mean, it's kind of actually kind of clever what they've done. Um, and I think this is maybe why ma- masonry has been so mysterious to people, because they've effectively rewritten history, retconned their own origin story, and made it appear that they have a lineage going not all the way back to ju- the building of King Solomon's temple in like pre-Jesus b- biblical times, they are actually claiming that they are bringing to you now and throughout time the secret knowledge and understanding of literally the secrets of the universe. Masons won't say that outright, but that is what they're implying with their King Solomon's temple knowledge. That's the only reason why that is so pivotal and important to Freemasons is because of the belief that King Solomon's temple itself was the most important remaining physical object from like biblical times. I mean, I, I bet you, even if you ask Masons who know all the stuff I'm telling you now, if you had them rank on a list of important biblical artifacts, um, King Solomon's temple would be number one. The Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and the Crucifixion Cross would be like way down the list. They understand um, that those things are just sort of tokenistic objects of power, but the King Solomon's Temple is the key to all power and understanding the universe and not just the universe, but understanding time, time itself. Now, what do you guys know about Isaac Newton? This is where I think it. It gets really interesting because I this is something I completely did not know of before. Did you guys know that over two thirds of Isaac Newton's writings, some of them totally unpublished until the 1930s, were all about trying to decode prophecy and and theology? That Isaac Newton, the guy who basically founded uh, gravity, who 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 theorized the gravity. Um, optics, the way that our eyes work and our vision works, and light, the theory of light. Uh, one of the most influential scientists since, you know, since Copernicus, since Galileo, was hugely into decoding prophecy. Newton was very full of himself, actually. If you read his own writings, he believes that God chose him to discover the secrets of the universe with his science. So even though his own science and religious views didn't intersect, um, they're very separated, very compartmentalized in his writings for the most part. Not, that's not the case with ev- all of his writings. But you'll find a, a surprising amount of separation. Like You wouldn't even know how religious and actually, I would say, nuts that Newton was, but nuts in like a brilliant way. I mean, obviously, if he theorized all this stuff, um, he had to be operating on like a very high level of intelligence or being able to perceive you know, layers of reality that um, most people don't, don't perceive. Um, edit Dark, I actually didn't know that. 2020 being the end of the world, that's kind of fascinating. That, that makes sense because one of Newton's last books that he wrote when he was in, in his 80s was basically saying, here's what was interesting. So Newton spent probably decades of his life believing that he was eventually going to be able to decode the book of Revelations and and the book of Daniel specifically. In the book of Daniel, it talks about King Solomon's temple also bringing about the apocalypse. So Newton himself, in his final book, I believe this was actually his final piece of writing, that for some reason went unpublished until like 1937 and went out on an auction. 
Newton says that basically if we're able to decode the secrets of King Solomon's temple, because he believed everything I've just told you. In fact, I would make the argument that Newton was one of the main inspirations for the modern iteration of what we understand as Freemasonry. This unification of science and religion together and this idea that King Solomon's temple itself will unlock the secrets to the universe, including science. You know, this is not just people who are thinking only religiously. They were mixing them together. Um, I believe that Masonry, the case I'm making for you today, is that Masonry, as we understand it today, um, was largely influenced by this school of thought and specifically very, very influenced by Isaac Newton and his obsession with King Solomon's temple. And there's other connections to Newton as well. Isaac Newton also wrote uh, a pretty large manuscript ab- about the Great Pyramid in Egypt, and he believed it held special numero- numerological significance that also proved science. So this is one of Newton's favorite things to do, is he would you know, dive into these really deep s- science areas and then be like, oh, the Bible predicted this. And here's some reverse engineering, like mathematical equations to show you that if you multiply, you know, 360 times 7, um, you'll get this date, specific date or something. So he, Newton actually believed that the Great Pyramid in Egypt was somehow able to measure the size of the earth. So Newton, this is, and keep in mind, this is like in the 1600s, 1600s, early 1700s is Newton was simultaneously obsessed with the architecture of King Solomon's temple and the Great Pyramid in Egypt. So those two things alone, um, I think, were hugely influential on Freemasonry. And it, it, it couldn't have just been Isaac Newton's own ideas, but the fact that he was one of the most popular influential figures in history pushing these ideas, there was some kind of spiritual and scientific significance behind these pieces of architecture. Because keep in mind, it's about the architecture. That something about the architecture has encoded secrets that can teach us something about not just God, not just planet, not just history, but the actual universe itself. Um, now here, so the ritual of Hiram of Beth, I'll just tell you, this is, uh, this is from Wikipedia. This is not from like a Masonic textbook, but this is essentially the story of Hiram Abiff. The tale of Hiram, Hiram Abiff, as passed down in Maso- Masonic lodges, underpins the third degree. It starts with his arrival in Jerusalem and his appointment by Solomon as chief architect and master of works at the construction of his temple. As the temple is nearing completion, three fellow craft masons from the workforce ambush him as he leaves the building. Demanding the secrets of a master mason. Hiram is challenged by each in turn, and at each refusal to divulge the information, his assailant strikes him with a mason's tool. He is injured by the first two assailants and struck dead by the last. His murderers hide his body under a pile of rubble, returning at night to move the body outside the city, where they bury it in a shallow grave marked with a spring of acacia. As the master is missed the next day, Solomon sends out a group of fellow craft masons to search for him. The loose acacia is accidentally discovered and the body exhumed to be given a decent burial. The hiding place of the three ruffians is also discovered, and they are brought to justice. Solomon informs his workforce that the secret word of a master mason is now lost. He replaces it with a substitute word. The word is considered a secret by Masons, but for hundreds of years, various revelations of the word have been made, usually all differing from each other. One such revelation as mock benek, or decay apparently, based on gestures given and words spoken upon the discovery of Hiram's body. Such is the general legend as related in the Anglo-American jurisdictions. So, this is basically just a little parable that the Masons invi- invented, which is kind of actually bizarre that 
a lot of Christian theologians, including Isaac Newton, believed that King Solomon's temple held the secrets of the universe and that these secrets were passed down to King Solomon directly from God. This actually, this Masonic tale contradicts that because it's saying that Hiram Abiff, this Masonic secret apparently that he had, whatever it was, the word of the Master Mason, was almost like more important than the than the narrative that God was instructing King Solomon encoding the secrets of the universe in this temple. So it's not really clear about that. And that's what's interesting about Freemasonry is I feel like there's all this sort of esoteric occult wrapping paper around what is sort of this secret belief that they have that they don't, maybe, maybe they share it at the 33rd degree. Maybe at that degree, they're like, yeah, we're just really obsessed with King Solomon's temple. And we think it's like the fucking abaca for the world or the universe. Um, I would recommend if you guys, I don't know if I've talked about him before on this program, but um, Shane Carruth, uh, the filmmaker who is behind the film Primer, um, he had a, a second film that was actually supposed to come out after Primer, which honestly, if it got made, it might be the greatest movie ever made. Like it's the screenplay for it is so bizarre, so fascinating, so well-written and crazy that you just read the screenplay and you feel like you've watched like one of the most epic, disturbing movies ever made. Um, and the movie was called The Topiary, A Topiary. And the concept of A Topiary, without necessarily spoiling anything, is it's sort of all about this random group of people all coming together across the world for thinking that they are somehow discovering these secrets of the universe that are being revealed to them in glints of sunlight. So like, you know, like when sunlight's peeking through the trees or something and you actually stare directly at it and it sort of blinds you for a second. The whole story that Shane Carruth wrote about is based around this group of people who all start seeing what they describe as glints in these sort of peaks of sunlight. And these people draw what they see. And the more glints that they see, the more they can connect these drawings together like a giant puzzle piece. And the puzzle keeps growing. And these people, um, you know, for their whole lives are searching for more of these glints. And they start taking Polaroid photos of the glints and then trying to put them together in a mosaic on their wall. And eventually they figure out that it's just an endless wild goose chase where everything feels like it's giving them some kind of meaning, a greater meaning to discover something. Something's telling us messages because in the movie it is like some kind of higher power or higher force or alien. You don't really know what it is that's feeding these messages to these people, but it's sort of a fascinating story in the sense that they never figure it out. And that to me is a kind of like what reminds me of this sort of masonry, um, biblical era decoding of these kinds of things is that if this was like, let's just say in theory that somehow this temple had encoded in it, like science about the nature of time that somebody somehow figured out the nature of time before quantum physics figured it out. Um, then they probably want, wanted that stuff hidden. I mean, <laughs> there's a reason why we don't know about that now. What I'm saying is there's just no way to actually correctly interpret any of this stuff from the past. It's just too disconnected from us it's almost like this movie. It's like trying to catch a glint and trying to actually build a puzzle out of it. It's impossible. Dre G. I actually, I'm sure they are. I don't know what that is. What is the key of Solomon? Because, um, I don't know if you've been listening this whole time, but, uh, Well, yeah, Mason Edatark. Hey, John, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, yeah, Masons today are that. I mean, it is just, it's like a fraternity for businessmen, basically. It's, it's really meaningless these days. But it played a very, very big role in American history. Very, very big role. Um, and there's also a lot of 
sort of other rumors about Freemasonry. Like there's a long standing rumor that at the 33rd degree, they actually introduce you to their own deity so that the whole time you've actually been misled into thinking that there isn't really one true God, that they believe in a God, but it could really mean anything, that God was more like the architect of the universe. Now, I must, I must make, reinforce this as well. Just so you understand how pivotal King Solomon's temple was to all this and the magical understanding of it, what is the Masonic logo? It's a G inside of a compass and a protractor. The symbol itself is means that God is actually the architect of the universe and that it was, it, it's almost like Mason's view of things is almost like an intelligent design, kind of a Christian-y belief that, but, but, but while removing like God's personality from like the Old Testament, they take this, they almost view God more of like a passive architect of the universe. But at the same time, there is a long-standing rumor that uh, Masons do believe in their own deity, which Christians and Catholics believe is actually Satan. So that's sort of what a lot of more paranoid Christians and Catholics would think about Masons, is that at the 33rd degree, you basically be indoctrinated into Satanism. Now, of course, that's a very familiar trope nowadays, and anything that's a cult you know, anti-Christian is automatically satanic. That's how evangelicals see these things. But back then, in the 1700s, in the 1800s, um, it was not seen that way. It was actually seen like, this is, This does seem really satanic. Like, even like, not very religious people thought that something was really suspicious about it. Who weren't, who weren't part of it, you know? Um, but... What I was going to say is that, um, I forgot what I was going to say with that thought, actually. But Masonic Lodges and the Masons as an organization, they're, you know, they're not really a, a singular organization. There's lodges and chapters all over the world that are totally unrelated to each other. But individual lodges and chapters and groups of Masons throughout time, and even really like modern history, have actually done false flag terrorist attacks and things like that. Um, and I'm going to talk about this more probably on episode three, because episode two of this history lesson is going to go really deeply into um, American history. And mostly, you know, pre-World War II Masonic history. There's, there's stuff after that too, which I'm going to talk about. But the P2 Lodge, P2 Masonic Lodge was actually part of Gladio. Um, and they were actually like staging bombings uh, in various parts of the world, I think mostly in Europe, to blame communist terrorists. There were false flag attacks. This is all documented. Um, I think it's even like a Wikipedia page for P2 Lodge. Right now, I'd say probably the most corrupt and creepy aspect of masonry is the Masonic Fraternal Police Order. And it seems to be also like a black police thing, too, that it's it's, um, you know, if you thought QAnon police were scary and creepy, I mean, way before QAnon existed, there are a lot of police who were like very, very hardcore, like any of these like Masonic police guilds. And that's to me is creepy that like, you know, like the cops are already a good old boys club. It's like the blue code. If you, if you see another cop doing something horrible and you report them, you know, you're kind of like taking that big risk of violating that code, kind of. Well, imagine like cops also having another layer of like a Masonic guild where they also are like part of a secret club. I mean, it's just fucking ridiculous to think about. Oh, hey, Maxwell, how's it going, man? Yeah, I miss the fact that we weren't be able to, um, uh, if anybody's knows anything about my music or Fluorescent Gray, Maxwell, um, amazing musician, uh, goes under the name Io. Is that how you pronounce your moniker, Maxwell? Um, the dude is a insane drummer. Uh, after this broadcast over, if you want to see some crazy drumming, 
um, check out IO and Maxwell's music. He's got some videos up on YouTube. Um, yeah, we, we missed you, man. We, we, it's, it sucks that of this COVID shit, Maxwell and I had a couple of shows lined up. Uh, he was going to, um, come to her, uh, here and COVID. So no concerts anymore for the fucking foreseeable future. What's crazy, Maxwell, is I remember when you said, oh, let's, let's postpone this to August. You know, I remember thinking, oh, that's super far away. There's no way that this can be going on that long. But now it's like, oh yeah, this shit's going to be going on for a while. Like, I bet you probably are even thinking of postponing your August shows now <laughs> at this point. <laughs> right? I mean, second wave, dude. Yes, I am consuming a soda from a fast food restaurant, in case you were wondering. It's my diet during the time of lockdown. <laughs> hopefully 2021 it's like almost a whole year after the uh our original plan how sad well it's life um so castlevania 4 eh? What do you guys think? What do you guys think about Castlevania 4? The best game ever made. So here's what I'm going to here's what I'm going to say about Castlevania 4. I'm going to totally switch gears here. Castlevania first of all, one of the coolest franchises ever. And let's just get this out of the way right now. Castlevania was a hammer horror. Oh no, Edge Catch 22. I'm going to I'm going to make a very strong argument that you are very wrong. Very wrong. Castlevania Super Castlevania 4 was arguably, well, I would say Castlevania Bloodlines for the Genesis was the last real Castlevania game before the facsimile anime Castlevania games exploded with the Metroidvania game, Symphony of the Night. Now, no, no, no. Let me make the case to you guys. I know I know. there's a lot of Symphony of the Night lovers out there. And if that's your favorite Castlevania, to me that means that, no offense, you're not a real Castlevania game fan. It's kind of like saying Mortal Kombat 10 is your favorite Mortal Kombat. If you've gone beyond Mortal Kombat 4, I don't... I don't even want to listen to you. You're totally out of your depth. Um, but so here's here's the argument I'm making. Castlevania, up until Symphony of the Night, was a hammer horror inspired game. Hammer horror is the you know like the British genre of horror, sort of the uh, later period you know. Dracula films, um, Peter Cushing, uh, what's his name? Christopher Lee. So look at all the early Castlevania games and tell me there's anything remotely anime or actually even Japanese in terms of like anime, anything about any of the original Castlevania games. There absolutely is not. Not at all. Um, that's very clear. For some reason, uh, a lot of these Japanese video game franchises, including Castlevania, decided that they now were going full anime and that Castlevania now was a Japanese-themed anime horror game where the characters even resemble sort of that effeminate anime, that long flowing hair, the, even the way the characters are animated in Symphony of the Night. It's straight out of an anime cartoon. If you like anime and you love your Castlevania mixed with anime, that's great more power to you but from my perspective um it was always just sort of like an anime fied version of castlevania and i was like okay that's cool you know i hope they go back to making sort of a more hammer horror themed version 
but I kind of dig this. It's cool. Um, here's another big complaint about Symphony of the Night. It just all takes place in one. It takes place inside. Um, one of the, to me the fun things aesthetically about Castlevania is that they n none of them took place inside the whole time. So conceptually, I just don't love that. And I know that maybe on some level that's how they thought that they could get away with making a Metroid um, style gameplay. But Simon's Quest was all inside. I mean, it was all like mostly outdoors. Only the the castles do you actually go inside. So So while I'm going to play Castlevania, I'm actually going to drop in here um, a link if you guys want to check this out. This is a little reading assignment. I mean, you don't have to read this, but I think you would find it interesting from all the backstory that I just told you. This is uh, Isaac Newton's writings on the on King Solomon's Temple. And before episode two, um, I would recommend you read John Quincy Adams' Notes on the Masonic Institution. It's available for free online. Um, that Christian conspiracy satanic panic guy, Tex Mars, actually like republished it. I think he was the, one of the guys who actually brought the book back, sort of gotten lost in time. Um, and yeah, I mean, so Super Castlevania 4, I mean, so here's why it's my favorite game. Graphically, fantastic. Um, one of the first Super Nintendo launch games. Total surprise. Barely actually had any marketing behind it. Um, the music for it is absolutely fucking incredible. Uh, Super Nintendo soundtrack. It is by far my favorite Super Nintendo soundtrack. I like it better than the music on the, any of the game on the Genesis. Um, easily top five uh, video game scores of all time. And, uh, yeah. Um, and one other cool thing about it is that it's actually designed by people who later formed Treasure Co. games. Uh, Treasure Co., Gunstar Heroes, Dynamite Heady, Radiant Silver Gun, Ikaruga. Um, very, very brilliant game makers. And you can see all of their DNA in this game, I feel. Even Gunstar Heroes. So if you've ever played Gunstar Heroes, there's the fixed shot mode where you can actually stand still and shoot in any direction, which is pretty cool to have like a con like like Gunstar Heroes brought some new mechanics into like the typical side scrolling shoot 'em up. And one of the, those things was the fixed shot mode. And the character had this very fluid motion to him where you could like shoot in all directions. Like you move your joy pad you know, like in a circle and like the character will like shoot like this, like really cool shoot bullets all around you. Um, I believe the original DNA for that fixed shot mode in Treasure Co's Gunstar Heroes comes from the bizarre experimental whip uh, gameplay movements in Castlevania 4. For some reason, the game makers of Castlevania 4 had this fixation on making you be able to throw your whip in any direction. There's one whip motion where you can just like shoot it forward. And then there's another mode where you can do this. Hold on a second. Let me get the sound down on here. So check this out. Okay, so that's the that's the regular whip motion. That's the that's the special whip motion. So it like it's like a particle animation or something. Really cool. It's a weird feature in the game that you almost barely use, but it's fucking awesome. So they did some other gameplay changes in Castlevania 4 from the previous three Castlevanias. One of them is you can jump onto the stairs. Jump off of the stairs, that's new. Another one is you can actually move in the air. In the original Castlevania, you can only go like that. And the jump would be fixed in the air. In the Castlevania 4, they made that. So you can like fake out, a, you know, if you're almost about to fall, you can be like, oh shit. I think those are big developments. Other other purists of Castlevania 
believe that those are actually bad and they, they like the more limited version of the movements of the character. One thing I forgot to bring up about um, King Solomon's Temple is that a lot of non-Christian people who are like more secular think that there's something magical about it. Um, in the same way that there's something magical about Soma from the Rig Veda from Hinduism, and that there's something magical about the Eulesian mysteries. Uh, so the ancient Greek secret society where they were believing they were talking to God. Um, so there's a lot of similar, like, obsession about King Solomon's temple from a similar point of view. Like, what was the actual magic properties of this? And some lazier historians have tried to say that, well, they've actually found, like, marijuana plants in what's supposed to be King Solomon's tomb or something. So that's sort of been used as the explanation for why these fucking stoners just thought that they had like discovered out the secrets of the universe smoking weed in King Solomon's temple sort of the you know the, the explanation or the implication Oh, 
Oh shit. Shit, what the fuck is this? That first boss is very, very easy though. Very easy. Oh, it is? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Totally disagree, JNNX. I mean, music in the original Castlevania is great, but and I wouldn't say I like this better than it. It's just this is one of my favorite video game soundtracks of all time. And I think the music actually gets better and better throughout the game. Uh, this stage in specifically has some great music. Let me just make sure um, I'm not missing anything really, really important from uh, what I want to tell you guys about. Oh, yeah. So Newton also believed that inside the architecture of King Solomon's temple also held the entire history of Hebrew history. So like the knowledge of the time scale of Hebrew history, he believed was somehow like also encoded in the temple, which was part of his belief in that it also sort of revealed the secrets of the nature of time because by believing that it all encoded the entire history, that it also was able to predict the future. That was why he also believed that by understanding the temple, that he would somehow automatically that that was the secret to understanding the language need, needing to decode the biblical prophecies in general. So this is what he, this is what Isaac Newton himself, and keep in mind this is like, you know, there's a lot of thinkers and people throughout history before Isaac Newton who are very famous philosophers, very influential people, thinkers this is what isaac newton himself believes about about solomon he says the philosophy both speculative and active is not only to be found in the volume of nature but also in the sacred scriptures as in genesis job job psalms isaiah and others in the knowledge of this philosophy god made solomon the greatest philosopher in the world um so newton's belief in this you know this idea that King Solomon's temple held the secrets of the universe to him made like Solomon himself basically the most important philosopher in the world. Vampire Killer Catch-22 is that Simon's Quest or part 3? I forget. Is that dun 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 Um I think it has to do with your age. I mean I played uh Symphony of the Night when I was young enough to really like it. I just knew what I liked more, and it was the original hammer horror aesthetic of Castlevania. I think I would actually really, really like Symphony of the Night, if it was the same game without anime-style graphics. Uh, if it looked more like a classic Castlevania game, I think I would actually like it a lot more. I know that's silly, but um, it really brings the game down for me in a weird way. Yeah, Simon's Quest. That is what I was thinking. I I forget the name of them. I, Vampire Killer. I didn't I didn't even remember the name. Did you know that um, two different Japanese women composed the soundtrack for Castlevania? For a long time, people thought it was just one person, and it's actually two different people. And I think each one of them made like half of the songs for the game. Uh. And uh, I didn't know about this until going on their podcast, but apparently stand-up comedian Brent Weinbach 
has like a very, very in-depth video game soundtrack podcast. Uh, the name completely escapes me now, but he's really, really knowledgeable about all that stuff. And uh, yeah, check that podcast out if you like video game music. Oh, also I wanted to mention that in the, the late 1600s and 1700s, the idea of building replicas of King Solomon's temple became popular. Became like a trendy thing. And this is also something I didn't mention is that it be, it, it, and it was sort of, there was actual a really influential three volume interpretation of Ezekiel which had all this discussion in it about the magic and the scientific backing of how King Solomon's temple was like this important key to unlocking the universe. It's three volumes written by this Catholic priest. And it was like actually huge, hugely influential on secular non-religious people too. Um, keep in mind also, even though Isaac Newton was hugely religious, he was heretical in the sense that he didn't believe in the Holy Trinity. So he didn't believe, like he believed in the individual, like spiritual aspects of it, but not the actual Holy Trinity, which kind of makes you incompatible with the Catholic Church. But what aspect of the Freebasids that you might already be familiar with is this idea that they're not religious people like the founding fathers talk about god a lot actually in their writings but they're not talking about like the god in the same way christians would they were deists a lot of historians will describe them as deists um their deism comes from their belief in freemasonry it was wrapped up in that it's not just like jefferson and these people were just deists out of a vacuum even though the deist movement in general was sort of growing in popularity, it was that Freemasonry is rooted very much so in that concept. And in the 1700s, it suddenly became popular for intellectuals to explore the Bible again from a scientific perspective. This three-volume thing about King Solomon's Temple and Ezekiel um, and let me actually read you his name. I wrote it down somewhere if you want to actually look this up. I haven't looked up the book, but Um, I put it somewhere here in my notes. Sorry, give me a second. Where the fuck did it, did it go? Mm. Oh. In 1604, um, this three-volume commentary comes out on Ezekiel um, by a guy named Juan Batista... Villapondo. And after he, so this is actually what one of the biggest influences on Isaac Newton's research. So Isaac Newton was really influenced by the religious teachings of this one priest and another guy named Joseph Mead, who popularized the idea of trying to decode the prophecies in the Bible. Like, you know, that's a really popular thing now at like grocery store checkout counters, like the sun and all these like tabloids are all about the Dead Sea Scrolls or they were. That's what they used to be all about. But this sort of philosophy of decoding the prophecies, um, using science, using math, uh, it, I guess it came from a guy named Joseph Mead, even though Kabbalah, you know, in Judaism had already been doing that for a long time. There's already a lot of numerology in that. This was more about Christianity specifically. Um, and sort of passing this idea on to more intellectual Christian people. It's like more intellectuals were into this stuff back then. It wasn't even like the crazier paranoid people were. So it's kind of an inverse of how it is today, is that the people who prophesize, the messianic kind of people, are all seemingly crazy and grifters, whereas back then um, it was like all these really high-level like academic people believed they were actually interpreting the prophecies correctly. Um, but my, I guess my point, is, if I didn't drive it home enough, is that 
the idea that there is some kind of scientific, mathematical, scientifically proven backing to like the Bible and Old Testament stories specifically um, was very popularized in the 1600s and 1700s. And it was actually kind of came crashing down in the late 1600s when a lot of people for some reason were predicting the end of the world was around 1600, like according to a lot of these biblical prophecies. And it didn't happen. And I think for some reason, Newton maybe felt ashamed or embarrassed that like his own predictions didn't come true. And he actually didn't publish very many of his predictions for this reason. They only came out like at an, at an auction, as I was saying much later, like Nostradamus style predictions. You know, they weren't that, they weren't that ridiculous, but he did also make predictions. Um, some people believe that he, that sort of his break, like he had apparently like some kind of psychotic break or depressive episode where he, it's considered like his career was over. That's what sort of history says about him. And it may have had something to do with this, that he couldn't figure out, like maybe his grand vision was to try to figure out a way to eventually link all his scientific discoveries with religion. And he just couldn't figure out a way to do it. And you could kind of see the desperation in this book he wrote when he was in his 19, or when he was in his eighties about King Solomon's temple. I mean, I think it's actually one of the only like blueprints that um, that Isaac Newton ever put out. And a lot of people have tried to recreate King Solomon's temple based on Isaac Newton's blueprints, which I don't even necessarily know where Isaac Newton got um, the blueprints from or how he came up with them. But he believed he had figured them out uh, for the most part. So to me, this largely explains not just this idea that, you know, this sort of popularity and in, in the enlightenment culture of religion that and all of a sudden having some scientific backing. Um, this also largely explains Freemasons belief system and where it's sort of grounded in this idea of a unification between science and religion that maybe seemed very, very controversial, you know, at the time. Maybe it seemed like a really rebellious thing to believe in. Um, but now it just almost kind of comes off as like a foolish sort of simplified, you know, kind of like version of intelligent design. That's what the overall Masonic belief system seems like. It's just with in all this wrapping paper of uh, the occult and these rituals. And these, and these, you know, important secrets and all this stuff. Maybe somebody who's listening to this can explain to me why a lot of the Super Nintendo emulators sound is a little bit janky. Like... I don't remember this part of the level at all. I'm in a cave fighting dinosaurs. Kind of seems really silly. Oh shit! Well, did I not get hit? My hitbox didn't exist in that little frame. Oh shit. I love that when you can jump and like do the hanging whip in the air. That's so rad. I feel like my least favorite stage in the game is the next one, where it's like you go inside of a cave for the whole level. I don't like the music either. I wish I could skip it on here somehow. Oh, shit. No!
JNNX, smart, smart, smart man. Very smart. Although, I kind of selfishly want to play through this whole game for my own pleasure. And I can tell you right now, I wouldn't make it past like level four of Solomon's Key because that shit is hard. Those games were too clever for me growing up. Lolo's Adventure, Solomon's Key. Um, I was a dumb kid. I only liked like action games and stuff. Like, I never got into those kind of games. But I, I like them better now. Like, I, I appreciate them now because I'm older. Fucking frogs. Son of a bitch. Yeah, slow down. Um, oh, shit. Slow down is an issue with this game for sure. I always thought that part was weird, like they meant to do it with both bridges, but they forgot to or something. Like, why would one of the bridges be stuck and then the other one have to be so interactive like that? It's, it's interesting. Oh, I'm gonna get my ass kicked. I don't remember what boss this is. Oh shit, it's Medusa. Oh, fuck! Ah! Yes! Sweet. Well, I lost my chance, so. King Solomon's Temple, episode. Um, super, super clever idea, though. Oh, motherfucker. It's like the shortest invincibility ever. These levels are longer than I remember. I don't know why I remember the levels being way shorter than this. And also, the game doesn't have a difficulty setting from what I was able to see. Maybe it does on a... Maybe there's a code for one. But... The game is easier than I remember, too. Definitely not a very hard game. At least not, not yet. Little Mode 7 action here. Have you guys, has anyone here who likes Super Nintendo emulators seen the um, HD Mode 7? It's pretty incredible looking. Especially a game like Pilot Wings. I don't know what they actually do to make it work, but it looks absolutely incredible. Um, F-Zero, Mario Kart, and HD Mode 7. Check it out if you haven't seen it already and you're a Super Nintendo fan. Also, there's a new 3D NES emulator that works with about 100 games. It's up on... Um, what's that store called? Steam? Uh, what's that video game store called online where you can buy, like, digital games? Anyways, they have a new Super Nintendo emulator where it looks incredible. You can actually play Nintendo games in 3D with 3D graphics. It's very strange. Maybe I'll do that one of these days on here. I love that slowdown. Very ambitious programming, whatever they were trying to do there, like every time you hit the enemies, they divide and it slows down the game. It reminds me of those blobs and festers quests for the Nintendo that you, that are like unkillable, but just literally like duplicate every time you kill one. Oh shit. 
Oh, I must have forgotten about that. Alright. This is kind of a cool riff on um, Chopin's uh, Funeral March music. It's a nice um, kind of homage to it with some like weird melodies on top. I, I dig it. Just cool to see what their influences were. That someone's like, yeah, let's do like a rendition of Chopin's funeral march, but let's make like a Castlevania twist on it. <laughs> like a like a scare like a traditionally very like dark, somber song in a children's video game. It's great. Oh shit! This, the music in this stage is incredible. Holy shit. Oh shit. Jeez, these guys are hard. A weird choice like straight jazz for a Castlevania game. It, it so works though. I don't give a shit when anybody says this music's incredible. Oh fuck. I think I'm gonna end here, guys. Um, so it looks like I'm on level three, three. So uh, I'll probably just try to die on purpose so I can get a continue code for next time, next episode. Um, but the plan is to pick up the game right where I left off and to pick up the history lesson about the Masonic. Well, we're gonna start the next episode on the Masonic history of the United States. So thank you everybody again for listening and watching today. Main politics episode 70. Uh, I'm very excited to already be up to episode 70 and uh, please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber of mine uh, in case you miss any of these as the air. If you become a Patreon subscriber for $5 a month, uh, you get instant access to every single episode of the show that I've done and you'll get instant access to it as soon as it airs, um, as soon as it's finished airing. So thank you so much, everybody. Take care. <laughs>